Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. And as you know, I talk about four different types of freedom, time, financial, location, health, freedom. And I'm always scouring the globe, looking for people on the cutting edge, on the margin, influencing, changing society in thoughtful and creative ways. So today I have a very special guest, Judy Rodman, and she's going to talk to us all about when voice matters. So she's got uh, five decades of award-winning experience as a professional singer. She's also a vocal coach, songwriter, and studio producer. So, you know, for all those listening on the podcast, you know, your voice, your tonality, your energy are all important. She's going to talk about that. So uh, Judy, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. Love the podcast. Thank you. And uh, I know you also have a uh, All Things Vocal podcast, which I, I do. Um, I encourage everybody to listen to it. And, Thank you um, for that. Yeah, I'm always interested in uh, people's origin stories. So tell us how you got into the to this industry and what you're doing now. Well, you know, I've been a vocalist since, you know, probably I was two or three years old. So I've always been in music. But uh, when I was 17, had I was actually going to be a research scientist when I lived in Miami as a uh, teenager and, you know, was going up through the sort of an advanced uh, school course. And I was really looking forward to become a research scientist. <laughs> then we moved, my family moved to Jacksonville and there weren't those opportunities. The school system was not Miami. <laughs> oh. So what happened was I got kind of shunted into what I always did. I never thought of it as a career because it's just part of my life, which was music. And by the time I was uh, 17, I started doing my my first jingle sessions. And uh-huh. I did a national spot for Gino's Pizza Logs and somebody, pay, somebody paid me for it. And I was thinking, <laughs> I get paid for this. And so it started me on the road of being a professional vocalist. And uh, so I, you know, ran into a lot of brick walls. And I know with you know, with physicians as well, because I have a couple of uh, physicians in my family. It's all about reinventing yourself sometimes through the years and trying to find your best new place that when the old place doesn't quite fit anymore, or there's a roadblock or something that's just, just throwing itself up in front of you. Uh-huh. So that happened for me in my career. Anyway, mm-hmm. the, the windows opened for session singing and so I, in Memphis, I became a, a member, a, a staff member of a jingle mill, we called it, that, you know, where we did like a, the Tanner Corporation did about 75% of the world's jingles. So you can imagine the workload. And those were the days that was like a few years ago. And those were the days before digital. Um, so editing required blood. And so that meant that I had to learn to really control my voice in ways that I wasn't taught, but I just sort of naturally discovered through having to do it for my career. Anyway, then I, uh, long story longer, I I got sick when my son was born, was in the hospital about three months. And I had an endotracheal tube down for a while. Mm. And it took about an octave and a half of my range when all was said and done and I got out. You know, for a singer, that's, you know, for a doctor to say, well, we saved your life. (laughs) That's kind of questionable, at least for me at the time. So I ended up having to figure out my own way to get my voice back. And then I moved to Nashville, got a professional coach and got more information. And then four years later, after being, you know, in ICU for uh, seven weeks in the hospital, three months for no women, I guess it was six years later because. It took me two years to recover, but six years later, you know, we had moved to Nashville. Uh, I had a number one record nationally. So I believe in the power of recovery and I believe in the power of the voice to find itself with some good information. And then I went on and from there and, you know, did a lot of background sessions on the biggest stars in the country, uh, you know, universe, and then got, had my own career my, my number one records, then the roadblock fell then when the label sort of fell uh, out of favor and they dropped the label, the, the BMG out in LA dropped a record, the record label altogether. So I focused in on my songwriting 
Uh -huh. And the songwriting generated another number one record for me, uh, One Way Ticket, which was Leon Rhyme's song. Then the songwriting kind of fell by the wayside after a few years, and I had to reinvent myself as a vocal coach. And so I've been full circle now doing it all, all of that again. My, my vocal coaching comes from my real world experience over a decade losing my voice, gaining my voice back, using my voice professionally, you know, winning, losing, running into brick walls. So I've become a kind of a holistic vocal coach who is interested in the health and well-being of voices and the effectiveness of voices in communication skill. And interesting. So it sounds like this recurring idea of reinvention, pivoting, you know, these are so key, especially in the, um, any sort of um, creative industry you always have to be exactly changing. And uh, I mean, now with AI, and you, with the ch you have to change almost weekly, which is, uh, you know, very fat, it's very dynamic. And basically things move at a faster, you know, more rapid pace. Um, right. A, a lot of people are musicians, but still your voice is very important because you, a lot of our, a lot of people are coaches your consultants, their public speakers. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about how to make your voice stand out so you can attract more clients. I think that the way that you stand out and attract more clients is to sound authentic and uh, like an expert and reflect, reflect your real being with the sound of your voice. There's something, you know, in singing we call artist branding, but mm. the truth is, the sound of our voice brands us as business people and as service providers, as you know, people that uh, can help. You can say something the same, use the exact same words, and say it differently and mean totally opposite things. Mm -hmm. You know, such as uh, "You better stop that" to a little kid, and you're just really inviting them to continue. Right? You better stop that, which mm -hmm. means the total opposite. The sound of our voices carries the messages uh, that we want to send out, and those things need to match. Uh, we don't need the voice of God anymore, you know, because that doesn't sound authentic anymore. We, as the public, are a kind of allergic to AI, to AI or at least perceiving AI. You know, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and then would love to get into the physical aspects of how to change our voices, okay? But just a little story. Like I say, when I started doing professional voice, there was no digitalization, no tuning, none of that stuff. And for musicians, you know, a horn player was real. A string player, if you heard strings, it came from a person that was sawing <laughs> this instrument, you know. And then came the a synthesizer, and all the musicians went, oh, my God, they're going to steal all our work, except the smartest among them actually learn to use the synthesizer. And so because they were the players that they were, they could program it better anyway. And to this day, there is absolutely no substitute in a synthesizer for a real instrument, if that's the sound that you want. For an organic, real instrument, They're, they can get really close. And for great demos, you know, you can sound like you've got a string quartet. It's nothing like the real thing because there's a tiny bit of aber aberration in the in the pitch, in the in the tone, in the in this volume, in the delivery, that makes it humanly connecting. If that mm. makes sense, so I would say the same thing is true with AI. And I I've got uh, Chat GPT, you know, that I look at for research uh, to just check what I think is true, and then I'll check what that tells me because I, I know that, that that can be inaccurate. But I'm not afraid of it because there'll be no substitute for where that research comes from, for the, the real person putting together uh, disparate things into a unique hole that even chat GPT couldn't think of. And I know that's true because I do have a podcast and I, a blog and when I write my posts, I kind of check things with chat GPT and it can't do what I can do. So I don't think we should fear AI. I think we should use it. And it's really, which brings me to, uh, you know, this idea, because uh, there's, there's, there's a great quote I heard um, from someone else. And it was saying, AI is not going to take your job. It's someone that 
knows how to use AI that's going to, so, it, you know, it's basically. Yeah, this is a good <laughs> way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing because if you know how to use like chat GPT, you can build an app in like, you know, weeks versus, you know, traditionally it took you, you know, a year, two years. And, you know, you can, you know, create so much more content. And um, what's interesting is, you know, you can use AI to create derivatives from your voice and actors, singers, you know, a lot of um, avatars, which is going to be really interesting, very, very interesting. Um, you know, people that innovate and pivot in that space are going to do very well. Uh, and we need to know how to use it because it's just, you can't put the worms back in the can. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you might as well like deal with reality. And that's what I've learned through my career is instead of whining, which does absolutely <laughs> zero good, you know, go throw, throw, throw a pillow or something and scream, but then come back and go, okay, this is the way it is. And this is what I'm going to do about it. Yeah. And I love it because, uh, you know, the news, all you hear is, you know, something that's really revolutionary or something that's a better product, you know, than, than the, the, the government and people just try and ban, <laughs> they just try and ban it and suppress it and it just goes. Oh to, no, it does not work. A, you might as well figure out how to use it. And I, I just really believe it will never replace it, the human understanding and and touch. Yes, it can do things better and faster than humans can in certain areas. Great. So so like let it save me some time and help me do things that would be impossible for me to do otherwise. One thing I interesting is um because your voice <clears throat> your voice is a muscle. So how how can um you know some how can people protect their voices, avoid vocal strain, mm -hmm. rest your voice? It's inc incredibly important for just about everyone, because everyone has some kind of form of work. And I don't know many forms of occupation, including being a physician, that doesn't require speaking. <laughs> At least if they can't sing, it doesn't matter. They're still speaking. So like I say, the tone of voice communicates really different messages and sometimes communicates things you don't want to communicate. I'm bored with you. I'm just kind of going through the motions. I don't really care about you. Mm. My voice is monotone and I'm just telling you the way it is, you know, and that doesn't sound very caring. Whereas yeah. you could be really caring and you're not really using your voice to communicate your, your message. The way the voice works, I, I happened upon this a couple of decades ago when I started teaching. It has to do with three things. And that is breath. I love the things that uh, your your other uh, guest that was before me, I think her name was uh, Megan Nolan. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? yes. About posture. Well, there's there's a lot to breathing. And we'll t I want to talk about that, uh, give you some ideas about that. But breathing, open throat or the changeable throat channel, which is what gives you different tone and communication skill. And that means who the heck are you talking to? And if you're just looking up in the air and not talking to anybody, in, which is a, a lot of times when you're, if you're doing a recording, maybe you're doing your physician doing a, a recording about uh, something and a PA or say a public ad address or something, and you don't quite know this, you'll be talking to the mic. And that doesn't set your brain up to use the right tone, or you'll be talking to the air, which again is not going to give you the right reason or is on the effort for making a tone. You know, the effectiveness of the voice means how well did you communicate your message? The health of your voice means how well did you do that without feeling absolutely any fatigue or strain? And how many physicians, my goodness, have to present and even to have patient, patient consultations or, uh, of course, professors that have classes uh, in medical school and everything. I think it would surprise most people if they heard me say, you don't ever have to experience vocal fatigue. And the reason is, if you know how, you can help your body create such an efficient air stream through your vocal cords to create vibration that the vocal cords barely feel it. They just get a little massage. Mm. And so that has to do with, uh, with breath and breath as compression so that it's a, uh, uh, it's so funny. I taught a I taught a uh, a cardiac uh, a surgeon one time, and I got my anatomy, you know, little uh, illustration that I have for everybody. And we laughed. I said, "Please excuse this. This is so basic." But 
I know from my family's uh, members who are physicians, physicians don't know about breath for voice. I mean, they do, but they don't know this that generally. And that is about the, the importance of the breath control. Yes, mm-hmm. we bring air up, but we need to hold air back at the same time. Mm-hmm. And long story short, what enables that is a wide diaphragm. So the diaphragm, you know, which is connected all the way around to the bottom of the rib cage, needs to be stretched wide so that when the muscles relax and provide a burst of air going up, Mm -hmm. they can't move too much air. They'll only be able to move a little bit, kind of like a drum head or a trampoline. You want it stretched wide. Well, how do you do that? And the way you do that is your upper spine needs to kind of straighten out, which opens the bottom of your rib cage. Well, this, this really goes hand in hand with, uh, with what um, uh, Miss Nolan was talking about with Megan. Megan was talking about with posture. Mm-hmm. It needs to be flexibly taught if you're working with a mic like we are today, or like I am today with this mic right here. You move your knees into your desk so your head is balanced over your tailbone or your heels if you're standing. Mm. And if you're standing and walking, maybe with a lavalier mic, walk knees first, not nose first. And all of a sudden, your voice feels better. And mm. that's for two reasons. One is breath. Your rib cage is wider because your head is balanced over your tailbone. And if my list, if the listeners, if your listeners will do that, like back their head and balance it over their tailbone, you'll realize your ribcage opened. Well, that's enabling the wide diaphragm that can control breath with the automatic nervous system. This means, yes, something's got to give. You can't just relax and talk. You've got to you've got to power it from somewhere, and what I recommend is powering it from the pelvic floor, mm. because that way you're squeezing from there, but you're squeezing yourself open. You're squeezing yourself open. You're squeezing your rib cage open, and so the more you want to support your voice, the more that support is being controlled. So again, it's like a compression engine centered in the pelvic floor. Mm-hmm. And if you want to try something to feel this, get a couch pillow and put it between your legs like a horse. Uh, imagine you're riding that horse downhill. And so your head's back a little bit to kind of balance the horse, you know, not to overbalance the horse forward. So your head's back and then you squeeze that pillow for power. So if you say one, two, three, four, five, and you squeeze the pillow on the word five, Mm-hmm. You'll, that's the feeling of the right power source. If you do that and your head is back over your tailbone, you'll realize you powered your rib cage even wider. So that's what cures vocal strain. That's what prevents vocal fatigue. That's mm-hmm. what keeps you from being a very successful speaker and incurring vocal damage. Interesting. So the second thing that that does is uh, help open the throat channel. So the tone of voice is what what, what I'd like to uh, share about next. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so tone of voice has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with pitch, volume, inflections, where you're going to pause, all that kind of stuff. You need variation. Otherwise, you sound like AI in a bad way. Uh, and you need he, 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 even variation that AI can't quite come up with yet because it wouldn't think to wait on that or make that a little bit longer or stuff like that. So we need variation. The throat channel in the human being opens three ways, up, down, and back. The upper part is eyes. So I'm going to invite everybody to try this little experiment. So you're going to count to three, but you're going to count to three with your eyes kind of, you know, like, little slits, like I call it poker faced eyes, where you're not really using your eyes. Your eyes are very guarded and very still kind of frozen. All right. And then the second way you count is with wide eyes, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that. And so eyes wide open and movable, like, oh my, you know, like crazy eyes, I call it. So I'll do it with you and you'll hear my voice. But if you try it on your own, you'll hear your own and feel your own. Ready? One, two, three. And then the other way. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. And I would ask you, what did you feel? What did you hear? 
that was different? Did, yeah. What did you hear in my voice? Well, the first one is more excitement and then um, a little bit more enthusiasm. And then the second one sounded more um, serious and more more concerned. Ah, very interesting. That's very, you know, that's that's a really good take because the first one I'm kind of almost yelling. One, two, three. And the second one, one, two, three, has more personality and and like you say, it it's it carries more messages in it. I think of <laughs> you know a, a more variable message, right? Yeah. Well, I will also tell you uh, that the first way, if you do the first way for a long time, you're going to get vocal fatigue. Uh-huh. The point of this of the ceiling of this open throat channel is talk with your eyes. And you even have to do that when you're on the phone with a client Mm -hmm. or when you're recording or when you are this thing, like a podcast thing. We need to use our eyes when we talk Mm -hmm. and that will make, uh, yeah, will give us more variation in our voices and it will help protect from vocal strain because you're lifting the ceiling on the voice cave and our voices, my voice sends pitches that want to go different places. So if we don't let them, they're going to butt up against the ceiling and it'll be one, two, three, which sounds kind of tight if you think about it, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Now, the floor of the open throat channel is the tongue and jaw positions. And so I'm going to, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to count to three and not move your jaw, you know, poker face jaw. And we do that when, when we're not sure of ourselves, we don't move our mouths very much. Or when we're in thinking mode rather than doing mode, you know, mm-hmm. for different reasons. And sometimes we do it and we don't even realize we're doing it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, no, don't move your jaw much at all. And then move your jaw like Forrest Gump saying life is like a box of chocolates. If you remember that movie. So we're going to overdo the jaw movement the second time. Okay. So ready? Tight jaw. One, two, three. Open jaw. One, two, three. Mm-hmm. And I didn't change anything but my jaw movement. And you could hear the difference, right? Yeah. Second one was more expressive and more mm-hmm. and more tonal. Yeah. And the first way would be vocally tiring. And there is a third direction the throat channel opens for so that that vibration can reach other like resonation zones in, in your body, in your face and in your uh you know, just everywhere that note wants to go. I like to think of it as above and behind me. Mm. And that's the point. The third way the throat channel opens is back. So we're going to do that one, two, three again with your head forward. Uh, Megan Nolan would would say is, is that slumped position? You can hear my voice change right now because I'm in that position. So head forward. And then we're going to pull our head back like we're incredulously going what? I can't believe you said that, you know, Uh or like a puppy dog going, did you say treat or trip to the vet? Okay. So head forward, count to three, one, two, three, head back or pull back and head level, but pull back one, two, three. Oh, wow. And you can hear the clarity in the second way. Yeah. So see when you're, when you're walking knees first, instead of nose first, you're working uh, your breath correctly and you're opening your throat in the back. So when you're slumping, not only are you doing all those things where the, the body is is telling the brain we're depressed or we're tired or we're, eh, uh, it's also affecting the sound of your voice. We need to, uh, you know, change the way, it, you can slump all day long as far as I'm concerned, unless you're making a, a vocal sound. Yeah, interesting. Uh, great conversation. How can people uh, contact you and uh, follow you, reach out to you if they, you know, a lot, if they're, you know, public speakers or coaches, they want to improve the, the sound of their voice or change their character of their, how can they do that? Well, my, I have a, a free gift for everyone at Judy Rock, and it's nine pages on vocal, uh, vocal health with vocal health tips. Specifically for speakers, I would also say I do have a speaking course for public speakers uh, about the sound of the voice. And that is just at speaking. Uh, let, for the all the audience out there and the listeners, let's thank uh, Judy for coming onto the show and really giving us a masterclass in vocal basics. And all of her resources will be in the links and show notes. And with that, 
Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Thank you.